Hello and welcome to Ember's Reading Room. You guessed it, another thrilling installment of Bedtime Tales. And one day we'll get to whatever that cover is. Unless that cover is an amalgamation of a bunch of stories, then we've gotten to them. <laughs> oh. Lux. Written by Linda Jennings, illustrated by Hilda Offen. Amber just pointed out that the cover is an amalgamation of all the stories. Of a handful of the stories. There's not enough room on the cover for all of them. And we're back to a couple Aesop's fables. So, the dog and the cock. A dog and a cock were walking through a wood when night fell. The cock decided to go roost in a tree while the dog slept at its foot. But a fox saw the cock and thought he would make a good supper. So when dawn broke and the cock crowed, the fox congratulated him on his fine voice. But come down so that I can hear it better, said the sly fox. Certainly, said the cock, who could see through the fox's wicked plan. But first you must ask my friend's permission. He's sitting at the foot of the tree over there. Of course, when the dog saw the fox, he chased him away immediately, and the two friends continued their journey in peace and safety. So, meaning being... I don't ever remember hearing this one. Yeah, I would guess don't be susceptible to flattery. Yeah, that, that's, that's a good possibility. All right, maybe we can figure out the moral on this one. Another Aesop's fable. The <laughs> tortoise and the eagle. There was once a tortoise who was very dissatisfied with the way he lived. He longed to learn how to fly and spent hours watching the birds circling in the sky. If only I could fly like a bird, he sighed. I'm sure that if I was up there, I'd be as good as any of them. The more he thought about it, the more discontent he became. Then one day, the tortoise saw an eagle flying by, and he suddenly had a very good idea. Please take me up into the sky with you, pleaded the tortoise. If you teach me to fly, I'll reward you with anything you ask for. The eagle thought the tortoise was very foolish. He knew it would be an impossible task, but the tortoise went on and on. So much that the eagle finally agreed. He picked up the tortoise in his beak and flew him high into the air. Is this high enough for you? asked the eagle with a mouthful of tortoise. <laughs> oh yes, said the tortoise. I'll soon show all those silly ground creatures a thing or two. Then the eagle loosened his hold and the poor tortoise discovered he couldn't fly at all. But it was too late. Down and down he fell until he dropped onto a big rock. He cracked his shell and bruised himself so badly that it took him weeks to recover. Don't try for the impossible, or you may get badly hurt. Okay, that one actually had his moral right at the end. Yeah, they just threw it in there. And, wow, I, I think this one might have been toned down a little bit, because I could just imagine the cracked shell and the eagle feasting on the tortoise. Hmm. Huh. Also... I was just surprised at, like, wow, this is getting kind of dark. The eagle was like, shut up, bye-bye. Mm -hmm. <laughs> nice picture of the eagle, which you'll be probably seeing on screen now. Yeah, pretty good. Goblin Globetrotter. Another story with goblins that don't look like goblins. Yes, we must do research on this. We must. I'm going round the world, announced Gary Goblin. He packed his spare tunic a freshly baked blueberry pie, and a bottle of elderberry wine, and a red spotted handkerchief. Little Goblin shouldn't be out after dark, said Father Goblin, so be home by sunset. But apparently Little Goblins can have elderberry wine. Apparently. Gary Goblin set off. He reached the edge of Peppercorn Woods, but deep inside the trees looked very dark and mysterious. I think I'll walk around the edge, said Gary to himself. And so he did. Round and round until his little legs ached. He saw the edge of Goblin Village and Humple Dumple Mountain. He saw Cockleshell Bay where he and Griselda had once spent a day. In the distance he saw a big green swamp which was the beginning of Dragon Country. Just as the sun was setting behind Humple Dumple Mountain, Gary arrived back at the very same spot from which he'd started. So... Once again, verification that we're getting continuity in the goblin stories. Because we've heard this stuff before. Yeah, apparently this is all just connecting together also. Goblins, I mean goblins. How was the world? asked Father Goblin. 
Very large and very tiring, yawned Gary. But one day, I'm going back, because I want to go somewhere really dangerous, beyond the green swamp. Mother Goblin tucked him into bed. One day, she said, when you're a big, brave goblin, but not just yet. And Gary Goblin thought she might be right. This weird theory just popped into my head. Maybe this is the way they see themselves. But of a creature other than goblins, so all the goblins, they see the ooh. Yeah, because a species usually isn't ugly to itself. As I nod. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Amber just waved her hand, and all I could think of was that scene from uh, La The Last Airbender. <laughs> which I can't really describe right now. It's just Toph waving a hand in front of her face going, that's what I would say if I could see. Yes, because they're riding Appa and they're looking for the library, but there's no earth, so she can't see anything. And she pretends to go, I found it. Like, that's what would happen if I could see. <laughs> All right. Rabbit moves home. Rabbit lived in a burrow underneath a big field of grain. He loved his home and was very fond of playing hide-and-seek among the stalks with all the other rabbits. One day, Rabbit heard a lot of noise and commotion. He crouched in his burrow, terrified, and when all was quiet, he poked his head out into the field. There, a terrible sight met his eyes. The grain had been cut down. His playground had disappeared. All that was left was blackened stubble. Well, it's no use moping, said Rabbit. He scuttled quickly across the stubble, and what do you think he found? A lovely large wood with twisty tree roots and hidden glades, and lots of empty rabbit burrows in which to make a new home. Much better than a field, said Rabbit happily. Okay, that's another one of those stories that's just there, but it was, it was cute. But a bunch of empty rabbit burrows. Um, they're only rabbit burrows if there were once rabbits in them, so what happened to all those rabbits? <sighs> okay, that looks, that looks silly. Yes. Christmas tree bird. Lots of Christmas in here, even though we're past season now. If you're watching this when it first goes up. If you're watching it later, I have no idea what time it is. In that case, happy holidays. The blue Christmas tree bird was very beautiful. Its tail was made from white spun glass and for years it had hung just beneath the Christmas tree fairy from the topmost branch of the tree. But this year, there were some new decorations. A frosted purple glass ball with stars, and a silver owl. Let's put the owl on the top branch, said Tamsin. Poor Christmas tree bird. He found himself stuck at the back of the tree, right against the wall. But that night, disaster struck. The cat came into the room and pulled the owl off the tree, breaking its top. The owl could only perch in the tub. So Tamsin put the Christmas tree bird back in its old place for everyone to admire. Another one of those just kind of there. Yeah. Nice bird, though. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Worm watching. Matthew loved worms. He liked them because they were slimy and slithery. In fact, he liked them so much that he decided to start a wormery. He fetched a huge jar from the shed and filled it with dirt. Then he put four of the largest worms he could find into the jar. Hmm. Ugh, said Mom and Dad. How can you like worms? But Matthew did. But though he watched the jar all day, he never saw his worms. They stayed deep in the middle of the earth. One morning, Dad and Mom said, Why don't you watch birds? They're much more interesting. And so they were. That tends to be an ending for a lot of these stories. And so they were, and so they did. So what happened to the worms in the jar? I uh, probably used them to find some birds. Yeah, but also, I think the kid would continue to like worms, but also watch birds. Yeah, you're not going to completely give up one thing you enjoy just because you find something else you enjoy. Mm. And speaking of enjoying... Yes, <laughs> this is the story with the picture that Lux was reacting to a little bit ago. The Greedy King. Once upon a time, there was a very greedy king who loved eating cream puffs. He ate them for breakfast, lunch, and tea, even dinner. In fact, he ate so many that all the bakeries ran out of pastry and the dairies out of cream. So the greedy king ordered that every store in the land 
must become a bakery or a dairy. There were to be no more grocery stores, no hardware stores, and no clothes stores. You could imagine how dreadfully inconvenient it all was. Very soon, the king grew so fat that he started bulging out of his clothes. But because there were no clothes stores, he couldn't buy any new ones. Then one day, he sat on his throne and crunch! It collapsed under his weight. But there were no furniture stores, so he couldn't have it mended. You must go on a diet, said the doctor, and eat fresh fruit every day. But of course, there were no grocery stores. The king began to realize how foolish he had been. He called back all the shopkeepers and told them to start their businesses again. And after that, the king only allowed himself one cream puff a day, which he ate for dessert after supper. Oh, wow, misspelling. Wrong, wrong form of dessert. That's desert. Hmm. Wonder why the editor didn't catch that. Hmm. Also, yeah, the, the picture of the greedy king, he just, he looks silly. Though I do want a cream puff right now. Gosh darn it. Sorry. No such luck. Okay, I think that's enough stories for now. Unlike uh, two-minute stories, we don't measure by stories. We measure by, hmm, I, I think that's enough for an episode. So this has been another installment of Bedtime Tales, written by Linda Jennings, illustrated by Hilda Offen, who often has interesting ways of drawing goblins. I've been dying to figure out a good pun. <laughs> you should have told me I would have done one earlier. It's just, with a, with a name, last name of often, it's a nice last name, but it also lends itself so well to puns. As is often the case, especially in tales. Yep. I'm sorry, I know I started it, but, <laughs> you know, I didn't used to be this punny. Yeah, and then she met me. Yeah, so, in case, oh, looks like we are about halfway through the book, judging by my bookmark. I make no promises on the number of pages, but by the bookmark, it's about halfway. Have you picked up a copy yet? Pretty sure Lux has been throwing those uh, Amazon affiliate purchase links over there. And uh, my good old Ebates link if you just want to go shopping for basically anything that you want to buy on the internet or in a store if you want to link your credit card to them. Amazon and Ebates are not affiliated with or sponsors of Ember's Reading Room or any content of the Lux Analysis channel or anything that we ever post anywhere ever. Thanks again for listening.